So I'm delighted to say joining us on the We Are West Ham podcast for the very first time is Talk Sport Sensation, Nat Sawyer. Nat, it's great to have you on the show for the first time ever. It feels very uncomfortable, me sitting across you being the presenter. I'm used to doing it, Talk Sport, weekend sports breakfast, early morning paper reviews while you're setting me up, asking me all the questions. Roles are reversed, feels a little bit odd. Yeah, I mean, if you think it's odd, then I also think it's odd. I don't like to ask <laughs> questions. I like to just sort of push it out there for everybody else to come up with the uh, solutions, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, um, but I'm delighted to be with you today. So thanks for asking me on. Yeah. That. Oh, absolutely. It's brilliant. Our pleasure. A spotlight on you this week, of course, being a massive Brentford fan ahead of the game against West Ham at home or at home for you guys on Sunday. I mean, it's a really odd one for West Ham fans. We've got a Europa Conference League semi-final first leg against AZ Alkmaar this Thursday. Then we go away to hopefully wrap up our passage to the final next Thursday. This game is wedged in between with our win against Manchester United on the weekend. Most fans and a few of the players, I think, Michael Antonio suggesting similar that we're pretty much safe now. I certainly feel that way. Almost. Couldn't care less about the game on Sunday, quite honestly. You've had a good season as well. What What are your thoughts, first of all, just like Brentford generally this year? We go backward and forward on the radio. I give you a bit of grief about Ivan Tony every now and then. We'll get into the semantics a bit more. But what's your general feeling about Brentford this season? Ninth in the Premier League, that's surely excellent. Oh. I think we have just had the most exciting season. Um, I thought last season couldn't be bettered in a way. I fully expected coming into these final round of games when the fixtures were released that we would be in a relegation battle and that we would actually perhaps even have to go into our final game of the season having to win, which is against Manchester City. Whereas, as you just pointed out, we are sitting pretty in the top half of the table, have had some exceptional results, have had some amazing days out that... I can now just sit back and enjoy. And I hope that we finish in the top 10, which would be a massive achievement for us. But if we don't lose another, if if we don't win another game, I should say, then I'm not that bothered because it's just been such an amazing season. Of course, I want us to win. But I think in general, because it's been so good, I can just sit back and relax a little bit more. Yeah, that is an amazing feeling. I mean, I I, I sort of feel the same way in in a different way because we've got the Conference League now. That's pretty much been my focus all season obviously you kind of if your form in the Premier League isn't great that's sort of taken away some of the enjoyment for a lot of the fans because you're you know you would continually ask the question I think Moose went on talk sport and said he'd happily take relegation if it meant we won the Conference League and you sort of as a fan you don't really want it to come to that but you mentioned obviously some of those days out you've had I was flicking through your results and one thing that struck me is even the games you have lost You haven't been thrashed. They've all been tight games. And it it just seems like I don't... No one looks at Brentford, really, and and thinks they're really hard to beat or resolute. I think it's fair to say most people think you play good football. You kind of... You and Brighton are kind of heralded as the the best-run teams in the Premier League. But looking at those results, it it does strike me that it's not easy to, to put goals past Thomas Frank's side either is there, is there a bit of that as well as the sort of attractive football that people like to watch yeah oh absolutely I, I think we have a very strong defense in the main um you know we've got David Rea in goal who has been exceptional at times this season um then we've got our center half it depends what we're playing obviously if we're playing a back three or a back a back four um you know if we got we've got Ethan Pinnock and, and, and Pontus Jan, uh, sorry, not Pontus Jan, Ethan Pinnock and Ben Mee, I should say. And Ben Mee, who came in on a free transfer, who I'm sure at the start may well have thought, I'm going to have to fight for my place here because of having come into a team that had done so well last season in the Premier League. But first game in, he was brilliant and he's always stayed in the team. So I think we've just got a really solid defence that has pretty much in the main stayed the same throughout. I mean, Aaron Hickey's had a few injury issues. But in the main, it's been pretty solid um you know Rico Henry is our left back who's absolutely fantastic that I just think to have that consistency has really helped us defensively so we've been able to have that relationship on the pitch that doesn't have to change that much um so yeah there is a good defense to us we have had a couple of games I must say where we've been hammered I mean at Newcastle and at Aston Villa this season we were hammered by both of those but in the main you're right we haven't necessarily been on the end of a, of a stonking victory by another team 
Yeah, well, I mean, what was that? That was sort of back in October, the Aston Villa game was, oh, and the Newcastle game. So, sort of since then, obviously, you're talking a fair few months ago, early parts of the season. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's just impressive, I think. Um, you mentioned Rico Henry there. Uh, one of the greatest travesties, I understand, in your mind that he hasn't been picked for England since Mark Noble was continually overlooked for his <laughs> for his service um, to to West Ham. But look, I mean, I was I remember I was at Thomas Frank's unveiling when uh, you know whenever that was. I don't know how many years ago that was. Now four years ago is yes, it? Thomas Frank's yes, been there is. probably. Yeah, and and I remember you know, sort of the parting, Dean Smith. He'd been there in the background anyway. I think I was one of about three journalists in the room um, at the Brentford training centre. You know, not huge fanfare around it. A little bit of trepidation among the fans. Mm. You see where Dean Smith is now, and he, what a phenomenal job! I remember being struck at the time that he was a really nice guy. He was really amiable, an amiable guy. He seemed excited, but. You know, you'll know when you speak to these high level professionals, some of them have just got that steely edge. Mm-hmm. And I could just tell he knew his stuff. And, and it, it struck me early on. I thought, oh, this is not like this, this guy, although no one has really heard of him, he could really do something special here. Is it fair to say, how do Brentford fans view him now, perhaps in comparison to Dean Smith? Obviously, it was a pretty golden era before with Watkins and Ben Rama, wasn't it? Yeah who we'll yeah. talk about in a bit. But how, how do Brentford fans view Thomas Frank? Well, we've got super Thomas Frank. That's all you need to know. I mean... <laughs> but we've got super David Moyes. Well, we exactly. haven't missed season, to be fair. Um, I mean, in all fairness, I'm, I mean, I can only really speak for myself, but in the main, I think the majority of us love him. We absolutely hmm. love him because he's so passionate as well. He so gets us as a club. You know, when he um, does his post-matches or pre-match conferences, you can feel that passion that he has for this club as well. Um, And I have been very lucky to to meet him a few times. And I just feel there's an aura around him. And maybe that's partly because I'm I'm a a fan who's just fangirling over him at that moment. No, but I know what you mean, though. There is something about him. He's very charismatic and very sociable as well. Um, And I think I do understand that he can rub opposition fans off up up the wrong way. by some of the things he says, but I think for us as Brentford fans, he is the best figurehead we could have because he is just so, just so, as I say, he just gets us and you feel like he just wants the best for us. Um, you know, and I'm always fearful that we always can talk about players moving on, but I'm always fearful that he's going to move on because he's done yeah. such an amazing job for us that it only seems natural that he should be part of a conversation for a bigger team at some stage. I hope that doesn't happen because I hope that he loves us so much they would want to leave. But of course he will at some stage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I think he's brilliant. And I think he's been a really refreshing as well for the Premier League. Yeah. Right now, I, I we talk about Saeed Ben Rama all the time. And listeners to this podcast will already be sniggering because the mention of his name usually gets me shuddering with rage each and every week. He can't even score the winner against Manchester United without needing a goalkeeping error, for goodness sake. He's got wheeling off, giving it these ones, pointing at the name on the back of his shirt in front of the stands. Wouldn't you if you still went in? No, not after scoring a goal like that, honestly. But look, you know, we're sort of chatting in the office this week about looking ahead to the game. And so Ben Ryan will obviously be, uh, he's held in really high esteem at Brentford, isn't he? I know that from from speaking to you before. And it's really bizarre. He splits West Ham fans almost perfectly down the middle. And both views of him seem to be like really extreme. It's really polarising. Like some people, I mean, you probably guess which camp I fall into, think he's terrible and would happily never see him pull on a West Ham shirt again. Think he's so wasteful and just decision-making poor and his numbers aren't good enough if you ask me after like three years at West Ham now I think it's been like the idea was that he'd be a regular we paid 25 million quid so it wasn't like he was a bargain basement buyer and the talk was that he was going to be this next big thing to take the Premier League by storm he certainly hasn't done that but you do have fans who infuriates them if he's not on the pitch every week and then they must see something I don't because they'll be like and there's genuine thought that he'll be our hammer of the year this year 
I think a lot of that is because he's been uh, the, certainly the first half of the season. He was the best of a very very bad bunch, or he was the least bad of a very very bad bunch. But talk to me, talk to me about Ben Rama. You can't even. Hey? You can't even give him I can't, that. No. <laughs> no, I actually can't. But but talk to me about sort of what it was like at, at Brentford, and then from your perspective, obviously, you probably don't watch West Ham as much as lots of the listeners this podcast do. But what have you, did you make of him at Brentford, and then are you, what are your thoughts, and how do you feel? Or are you surprised by what he's gone on to do since? Do you know what? In in general, when you talk about players that have been at Brentford, and weirdly, I was talking about this last night. Most of the players that have gone on from Brentford have not actually gone on to deliver what we would have expected them to have done. You know, you mm. Neil Lope, for example, went to Brighton and, again, didn't really set them alight. He's gone to Everton. I'm not sure that was the right move for him anyway, but, again, that's not worked for him. Really, I think you could only pick out Ollie Watkins as a standout yeah. player, even Ezri Konza, but he was only with us for a season, so I, I can't really count him. So, in the main, it, it sometimes you do feel a bit like, oh, what a shame that these players haven't kicked on. I absolutely love Ben Rama. Um, of course I do, because he was part of that amazing front three, the BMW that we had during that championship campaign in particular. And he was phenomenal. And he was, um, you know, he had personal tragedy when he was at the club as well. And I What know was that for anyone who doesn't know? Oh, sorry. Yes, his uh, father passed away while he was oh, playing right. for Redford. And uh, the club gave him an extended period off off to obviously deal with all of that and he came back pretty quickly in all fairness but I know he's always spoken about the affection he has for, for Brentford I think partly because of that because they were so giving of, of ensuring he had his time away to deal with that um, but as a player I always thought and I've even said it at times since he left that we'd always miss that kind of flair that he would bring to the pitch now I know you're obviously going to think, what flair? There is no flair. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you mean when he cuts in and then and on the corner of the penalty area and curls crosses out for goal kicks nine times out of ten? If you mean that, then yeah, I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> I clearly will. He's at the wrong club and he could just come home. That's obviously Well, look, doing. there is a bit of that. There is a bit of that. Sometimes players are just good fits, aren't they? Certain yeah. managers, certain systems, yeah. like the Brentford way and the Brighton way, they're very specific ways of playing the clubs are set up in a certain way aren't they and he's a bit of big fish small pond maybe i don't think ben rama deals or has dealt particularly well with having to fight for his place pablo for who's been up against for most of his time there is a very very good player who i would rather see on the, because he works harder he's not mm -hmm. bad on the ball but he's far more efficient but he's just not as flary do you know what i mean he'll never do a you know a little croif turn put it through someone's legs and that's yeah. nice, and I think that's why people love him. Uh, sorry, Ben Rama. But for me, I'd rather have a Jared Bowen. Jared Bowen won't – he doesn't nutmeg anyone ever. He's just quick, powerful, and efficient with the ball yeah. and puts the ball in the net and sets it up for other people, which, I mean, do correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's the point of football is to score goals, especially when you're an attacking player. But a lot of the West Ham fans yeah. <laughs> who seem to love Ben Rama apparently have a different idea on that. But, look, Nat, let's, um, let's talk about the game. Sunday's so two o'clock kickoff uh, at the Brentford Stadium. I've been down there uh, a couple of times since since you moved. First of all, before we go into it, what do you make of it? Do you sort of feel like home? You settling in? Obviously, it was sort of purpose built, unlike ours. But how do you make of it? I, I love it. I absolutely love it. Don't get me wrong. Griffin Park is where I grew up watching football, and that's where I fell in love with Brentford and I fell in love with football. So that will always have that special place in my heart. Obviously, COVID then hit, so we didn't even get a chance to say a proper farewell to Griffin Park, mm. and then. We obviously were slowly introduced to the GTEC because uh, I think the first game that we were allowed some small attendance was the Bournemouth playoff semi-final, which I think was only 4,000 or something like that. So it was a slow introduction as well into life at the GTEC. But actually, I think we've made it our home so quickly and it feels like we've been there for years. Um, and I love it. I love it. I know some people might mock it with the multicolored seats and they'll say it's a Lego stadium, whatever, whatever. But I actually <laughs> think it's brilliant. And we can have sometimes we have amazing atmospheres and nights there. Obviously, like some games and some grounds, the atmosphere can't always deliver. But when it's cracking and when it gets going, it is one of the best, best occasions I've ever in, enjoyed at football. So, yeah, I love it. I absolutely love it. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's the thing. West Ham's ground has now become to feel a little bit more like home. 
exactly because yeah. of what you said because there's been some amazing occasions there i think Sevilla yeah. at home in the europa league last year cemented it for most people and if if after that they still didn't like it then they're never going to so i, I see what you mean it's, it's difficult to move isn't it but um yeah it, i think it's the occasions and a few good victories I, i've said this twice already before we get onto the game just quickly you mentioned earlier about your uh, sort of moments this season you've beaten chelsea and you've beaten Fulham. Which which, which of, of those are your favourites? I mean, Stamford Bridge away surely caps them all. Yeah, of course, of course, that's huge. Um, we did that last year as well, so it's kind of becoming yeah, a bit of a true. Um, <laughs> you just do it all the time. You always go to Chelsea and win. Yeah. Uh, I don't necessarily predict that for next season because who knows what Chelsea will be like next season. Um, I. It's always nice to get one over your bitter rivals, Fulham. And there'll be some Fulham fans that will say, oh, Brentford are not a rival of ours. But they want to beat us just as much as we want to beat them. So, yeah, to, to beat them like we did, yeah, it was cracking. And so I would probably edge that, even though to win at Stamford Bridge is an amazing achievement. That isn't our best win of the, of the season, though, obviously, because mm -hmm. winning at Manchester City. Yeah. At, at this moment in time, hands down, is the most amazing Premier League victory I will ever be. I'll ever witness as things stand, I should say, because I was there. So it was amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing stuff. Amazing. Right. The the game on Sunday then. Now, how do you see it playing out sort of style-wise? Mm. Uh, people will, well, may or may not watch uh, Brentford who listen to this podcast. Obviously, we've, we've got the, uh, the Europa League, Conference League, sorry, either side, as we've mentioned already. But how do you see it playing out from a style perspective, like Brentford point of view a bit more so? Do you know what? <laughs> It's interesting because people often say that we, we play a lovely brand of football, and we do at times, but we also can play a really dogged kind of football that isn't exciting, that will that opposition fans will come away and go, what's all the fuss about Brentford? So <laughs> I imagine that we'll try and take the game to you because, of course, we'll try and take advantage by the fact that you might be a little bit tired from your Thursday exploits and hope that you're still a little bit distracted by that with the second leg to come as well. Mm. So I think the best idea for us is to go at you and get at you from the start so that we can score as early as we can and make it as comfortable as it can for us anyway. Um, I don't want it to be dogged. I don't want it to be, you know, giving you all the ball and letting you play the game as such. I think we need to be that team. I think we need to force it, force ourselves on you. Um, but like I said at the start, if we don't win against you, yeah, I'll be, I'll be disappointed like any fan, but it's okay because we've had a really good yeah. game. Yeah, no, I, I like that. It's quite quite refreshing to speak to a football fan who, who feels exactly that way. Um, any any team news? You know, if you've got any injury worries or? Uh, uh, no, I think we're all good actually. Um, there's Christopher Ayers just returning from injury. Uh, we've kind of, I mean, we've we've missed his experience in terms of his. He hasn't. I mean, to be fair, he's had a very injury hit season. So I say we missed his experience. He was very involved last season. This time around, not so much. So if he, if he's needed and if we were to go to a back five, you know, you might see him introduced. Um, but in the main, I think we're all pretty fit and, and raring to go. So hopefully we'll be at it from the start, like I say, and uh, it'll be a good game for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, no, it's been absolutely brilliant having you on. It's really, uh, the pleasure is definitely all ours. It's nice to talk to you about uh, Brentford. I do enjoy giving you a bit of stick. But this season, the absolutely amazing campaign. Um, for those of you in, in West London, especially with a couple of the victories you had there, the City one obviously beat Chelsea and Fulham, proper hats off. And I think there's a lot of envy among not just West Ham fans, but among fans up and down the country of how the clubs run and sort of continually punching above your weight, which is mm. very impressive indeed. Nat, before we let you go then, give us a score prediction. Sunday afternoon, two o'clock kickoff at Brentford, Brentford v West Ham in the Premier League. <laughs> I hate predictions. I think, well, obviously, I'm going to go for a Bees win. Like I say, I hope you're distracted. I'm going to go with a 2 1 win. And that sort of goes 2 1 win to Brentford. Yeah, I think it's going to be one of those annoying ones where West Ham, I'm really hoping we just have a convincing win on Thursday. I'm so looking forward to it. I reckon we're going to make difficult work of it. Yes. What's that? But it's your priority, isn't it, now? Because you're not of course, but. You're it's been mine for months. <laughs> well, <laughs> Definitely yeah. not. That win over Man United has helped you so much that it would take an almighty turn of results for you to go down there. Yeah. So basically, exactly. you can just let them know, don't worry about the Premier League now, focus yeah. on Europe. 
<laughs> well, that's my thoughts exactly. And I think it is those of David Moyes and the club as well and the players, sorry. But um, I, I've just got a horrible feeling we're going to leave ourselves needing to do a lot in the second leg. So I'd like to see a three or four nil Thursday. I think it's probably going to be like a draw or maybe we nick it 2-1. And then I can just see us, it'll be classic, playing a bit of a second string side mm. uh, against you, winning like 4-0, and everyone goes, why didn't you just play like that on Thursday? <laughs> no, honestly, because now the pressure's off. Yeah, now I, I just see, you know, play a few of the string uh, sort of periphery players who've got something to prove, and then beating you 4-0. So I'm going to go for 4-0, um, just as an optimistic that is absolutely prediction. absolutely extreme. But then again, after all the results we've seen recently, you just never know. And a lot of people are suggesting exactly. we're going to the beach. So who knows what's going to happen? You, it could well happen that way. Who knows? Exactly, exactly. And uh, there's no money on it. So, you know, <laughs> what the hell? But listen, uh, no, it's been absolutely brilliant having you on. Thanks for giving us... Okay, you even wore your uh, tracksuit top as uh, I pay homage to your club. I love it. Look, Nat, it's been absolutely brilliant having you on. Thank you so much for giving us your time and joining us. Nat Sawyer from Talksport, their huge beast fan, looking ahead to that game. And you'll have some.